Well, we welcome everybody here, and we're grateful for your desire to be in the class and to study from God's Word on this Tuesday evening. We'll have a prayer in, in just a moment, but we are studying from Ecclesiastes. We had the introduction in the last lady Bible class last month, and we want to begin in the text this time. So before we get into the study of the text, let's have a word of prayer, please. Our holy and righteous Father in heaven, we humbly approach thy throne of glory and grace, thanking thee for the day and how in thy name, knowing that thou art the giver of all good things. We're thankful especially for the spiritual blessings we enjoy in Christ. And pray thou wilt help us to fill ourselves with thy word that we might understand better what it is to live like Christ and to glorify thy name and to prepare ourselves for eternity. Help us to be mindful of the gospel as thy power to save us from sin and the obligation of the church to do what it can to spread the gospel. And may we grow in our love for men who need the gospel. May we be mindful of our duties to thee in being full of good works and ready into every good work to study thy word, to know what those good works are. This is the study of Ecclesiastes, to understand the design and purpose of life here in the flesh, and that we might know what worldliness is as it's contrasted with spirituality. Look down upon us with mercy and be with those of us who are sick. Strengthen us all, and may we put our trust in thee as we seek first thy kingdom and thy righteousness, knowing all these things shall be added unto us. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, I want to carry us into the text of the night, and I hope to be able to, to do this, to go all the way from chapter 1, all the way uh, from 1 into chapter 2, verse 11. That's a whole section. Not going to just do it chapter by chapter, but try to deal with uh, the subject matters. I will reiterate again that the approach that inspiration through uh, Kohelet, the preacher, as it's translated, takes is for the inspired writer, because God wrote the Bible, takes is, is living this life as if all there is is this life. I don't know whether any of us ever sit down and think about that or not, but most people do that whether they fully intend to do it or not. Now they do what? They seek after happiness and peace and contentment on the basis of fleshly appetites being filled. Um, they don't look beyond this life. They don't think of a heaven or a hell. They certainly don't think of the fact that there is an eternal part of them, or I should say an immortal part of them. That will continue on and never think about giving an account of how they think, how they speak, and what they do to God before God. But if you know the Bible, your own viewpoint changes. I frankly don't know anything that could change our viewpoint from the wrong one to the right one, but a proper understanding of the Bible. Now remember, this is the Old Testament. A lot of people don't think that. Folks in the Old Testament, the Jews in particular, under the law of Moses and the prophets and so forth, could have a proper understanding of things, but this book by itself teaches different from that. They sort of like Jonah, when uh, people say, well, God only loved the Jews, but that's not the case. Uh, Jonah would have liked it that way because he did not want to go preach to the people of Nineveh and Assyria. Because they might truly repent of their sin, although they were not under the same law that the Jews were. And he didn't want to do that. And that tells us how bigoted and narrow that Jonah was. Well, it's hard for us. In fact, I guess really we can't do it, but we can sort of try to understand the mindset of these people. I've never lived in a kingdom. Uh, not not even one like uh, limited monarchy, a constitutional monarchy like England has. 
So it really departments where it does everything. Um, I've never lived in absolute monarchy. I would know uh, how to think quite that way. I don't think uh, any Americans really would. I guess the closest we have to an absolute monarchy today would be probably Saudi Arabia, unless you want him to look at a terrible totalitarian dictatorship that would be North Korea. But the point is, uh, a king at that time and uh, a monarchy, or some were queen, but the monarch had the final say in everything. Now he had advisors, counselors. Nevertheless, that's the way it was. Well, it's only logical then to the mind of the people to whom this letter was written that somebody like Solomon, who was above many kings, who had position and power, and because he prayed for it, wisdom that few had, if anybody ever excelled, to the wisdom that God gave to Solomon. So inspiration had this come through him as to here is a man, sometimes, we, have you ever said, well, if I had this, I would do that? Well, we all have. Well, Solomon didn't have to say that for his day and time. That's the whole point. Everybody that knew anything about Solomon knew he could do whatever people were capable of doing at that time. So, you have the words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem, coming from the standpoint of, I'm, I've tried everything there is of this present world to find happiness. So he's viewing it that, from that angle. Vanity of vanity, said the preacher. Vanity of vanity, all is vanity. Uh, then he says immediately, what profit hath a man of all his labor, which he taketh under the sun. Well, let's, let's note that the first two verses, and we probably emphasized this last time because I said some things would come back in the text that we emphasized in the introduction. That the premise of this whole book is found in those first two verses. Uh, the reasoning that he will do throughout the book is based on this premise. And he starts with verse 3, which I've already read. And he goes all the way through verse 11 in the first chapter. And as you read that, you'll see that he is talking about if all you live for is here in this world, and that's all there is, is the way this world works, then what he's what he's talking about is the futility of man's labor. And if you really, I, I've always liked to read biographies. And of course, people get biographies uh, written about them, or if they write their own an autobiography, because they usually are renowned for something. Or uh, uh, they've accomplished some great thing or thing. So they're written about. And when you see somebody that lived life only as it fits into time and space, material things and fleshly appetites, so many times there's futility in that person's life. I was watching it. I haven't finished it yet. I just stumbled across it. Um, can't call his name now, but uh, Herb Alpert in the Tijuana Brass. Very, very famous. Couldn't get more famous than he got in the 60s. At well, least still alive. He was in his 80s. And I was watching that. Well, he confessed up that he, I have all of this. I have fame, I have, of course, he's a very talented person. And uh, he accomplishes, has accomplished so much in the field of music. And what you may not know, and I didn't, that he is a great artist. I didn't know that at all. And uh, he wasn't known so much for this, but he's quite a good singer and did for, for a few things. Uh, but he was, this was him speaking. He said, I'm wealthy. I have great talent, I've accomplished this, and I'm miserable. Um, he ended up divorcing his first wife, but they all seemed to do something like that. And uh, which I think he had two children with her. But then it goes on and tells about 
the other woman that who he had known for quite some time when he married. He was also an entertainer and so on. You see, there's no guidance there from God. He's just bouncing away. Well, that's some famous person most of us know, but you don't have to be famous to fall into the middle of this kind of thing. So he was saying, actually, as I listened to him, what profit hath a man of his all his labor, which he take from the son? And yet it seems that no one ever learns this. Every generation, uh, as the great majority of that generation, is doing the same thing. Yeah. Where is happiness? Well, it's in things. So this is not a difficult message to get. But it's one that every generation seems to have to learn, and most people don't. Notice verse 4, one generation passeth away, and another generation cometh, but the earth abides forever. What does he say? Things are going to continue to be this way as far as earth is concerned. People are always going to have the same appetite of the flesh. And if they only have a view that this is all there is, you're going to make the same mistake. It, it's just that way. Um, the sun also riseth, the sun goeth down, hasteth to his place, for your rules. What's the idea of saying things like this? The idea is, in living life in the flesh on earth, it doesn't change. They say, but, but Solomon never knew about computers. He never knew about all this medical advancement. Okay, we do. What's changed? We have a lot of blessings today because of scientific discoveries and application. But really, what's changed is to people trying to find happiness and peace and content. They still try to do it the same way. Many do it from the standpoint of seeking high degrees and, or, or trying to get known for something. Uh, I think sometimes that in looking at the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, then we have the vainglory, is that word vain, or pride of life. I think sometimes that one sneaks up on us quicker than the other two. Um, do you like to be complimented for good things you do? Mm -hmm. Do you like to be noticed because you're a good person? Is there anything wrong with that? Mm -hmm. Well, what's flattered? Telling you something you know that's not true. <laughs> well, not necessarily so. Not necessarily so. It might be. Yeah. But you can flatter somebody. We call it buttering them up. You can flatter somebody by just fawning all over them for the good things they do. Because people like to hear it. I know we all like to hear it better than hear somebody on our case all the time. And so there's a danger there. Anything that's peculiar to the flesh and how we function on this earth is an avenue for Satan to work. And then it's all circumspectly. How he's fooled for his wife. Redeeming the time of the days of evil. That's the reason that when you get complimented, appreciate it, and keep on keeping on, certainly want to evaluate it. Did you really do something good? Or did somebody kind of butter you up? <laughs> Whatever. You can't, we, we say, don't let it go to your head. Now, one of the things that some of the people interviewed about who knew and were personal friends. Of Herb Alpert said that he was a very humble man. He said one time that he was in the third grade. It tells you something about how when we don't know some things that affect people like we do. His teacher was trying to decide whether he would get an A or a B in his reading ability, and she couldn't decide. So she brought another teacher in to evaluate him, and he said that just scared me to death. He said I was uh, I was so jittery and so nervous I couldn't do anything. And she judged I would get a B if I deserved that. So I got the B, and I clammed up for the rest of my time and just kind of withdrew. 
Now, you know, there has to be some things there that we don't know about, or maybe you didn't even recognize. But things can happen to folks at formative ages that can impact them way on down the line. And, and that's the reason that children um, can have so much impact them that affects their years that they're when they get to be out of them. And they may not know why that they're having trouble in dealing with this mentally or emotionally, whatever it is. It's because of the way it was done. Now we should be able to say, well, if you're old enough to understand what was done to you and it was wrong then, then you're old enough to say, don't let it bother you. But see, it, it goes deeper than what we realize. It, it affects the mind. It affects the formation of our view. We will end up doing things uh, in a certain way or even not doing them or maybe having certain phobias, uh, mild scares about things or feelings about things, all because of the way certain things were done and it's become such a part of our conduct, we don't realize we're that way. So it, it makes a difference, uh, things that way. Um, notice what he says in verse 6, the wind goeth toward the south and turns the fountain to the north, it whirleth the fountain continually and the wind returns again according to its, its circuits. What is trying to be said there in this natural working of things in the world? It's the cycle of nature. It's the way the sun rises, the sun sets. The wind blows one way, goes the other way. The river flows into the sea and it, you know, it doesn't fill up, I guess. I don't yeah. know if talking about evaporation or whatever, and it rains. And because it's just the cycle of nature, of creation. And he's using it to show it's the same homegrown thing throughout life. But now here's something that happens, and those of you who studied may have picked up on this as Matthew was talking about it. There's some scientific things that are being brought out here that was far, far, far beyond the scientific knowledge of that day and time. And this is one of them is air circulation. Um, the the way it works, and nobody nobody saw this in the science until about 1940. Close to it. The we'll start with the North Pole or, or the poles. We we'll just start with the North Pole because we're affected by it. Where does the air come from that that comes down at the North Pole? Because it's cold, cold air. What does it rise or fall? It falls. It falls. So. It hits there and it flows down toward the equator. Now, what happens there when it gets hot? It goes back up and it goes back around again. And it does the same thing. Now, the point is, it always does. <laughs> Maybe she really shifts a thing or whatever. And all of that's involved. Even when it comes to being a weather person, because of a lot of other things, because highs circulate clockwise, lows circulate counterclockwise, they intermingle, and a front can come down. You've seen this when, when, when we would have hurricanes out in the Gulf or somewhere, and they say, well, this is not going to bother us because there's a strong front coming down that's going to shut it off over this way. But that's been that way since the flood. Now, I don't know what the Earth's atmosphere is like before the flood because uh, the whole world changed. All manner of natural law changed. Just everything changed. But that's one thing uh, that's involved in that. But what's his purpose? He's not giving. Those people that read this originally, they didn't, they didn't care where the air was blowing from, for that matter. But it's to say what Nancy said. Things don't change. The natural order of things are in our life. Um, somebody said in the Isaiah's prophecy that a virgin would have, the virgin birth of Christ would bear a child, like uh, Isaiah 7, 14. And the uh, liberals tried to say, yeah, but the Hebrew word Alma means just a young woman. Well, you remember Isaiah 7, 14 was given as a sign. I heard, I heard Brother Woods or 
Well, he does speak the same one time. He said, I'd like to know how a young woman bearing a child is a sign. So that's what young women have always done. <laughs> yeah. So, so the point is, when you get over to Matthew 1, and you've got the Holy Spirit guiding Matthew to record Isaiah 7 and 14, he uses a Greek word that can't mean anything but virgin. And that's the Holy Spirit, if you please, translating the Hebrew into Greek. And besides that, common sense would tell you that that wouldn't be a sign with just young women have babies. Always have. So, the thing we're seeing here is the point. Remember his premise? Vanti Vanti said the preacher, Vanti Vanti, all the Vanti. Well, what's he saying? See, here's what I mean. That's what he's saying. Here's what I mean. All these things happen. Verse 8, all things are full of labor. Man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. Uh, well, we skipped over one Nancy brought out. Verse 7, all the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full into the place from whence the rivers come. Thither they return again. Um, they learned about that kind of thing in the scientific discovery um, basically about 1770. Um, and it was observed. In fact, Benjamin Franklin wrote a treatise on this because it was so newly found as late as that time in the 18th century about the uh, flow of the rivers. Because a thinking mind would say, all the rivers run to the sea. Why aren't the, why aren't the seas full? Well, it's evaporation. And give you something that happened that we took note of when we lived in Muscogee. They built, I think it was in the 50s. I've been mean, even into the 60s. And I know some things were done in the 60s. But you know, the Arkansas River runs from Tulsa all the way down through Muscogee and then across the little rock. And finally, it goes way on down to Arkansas and the Mississippi River. Well, what happened was back on some of those other rivers, they did like a lot of places have done. They built um, dams and they built like Lake Tenkiller and a bunch of other lakes and made rather large lakes. But they also in the 60s had the McClellan Kerr uh, navigation project, project, which those are the two centers at that time of Arkansas and Oklahoma that opened up the waterways of the Mississippi all the way up to Port of Catoosa, which is the port in Tulsa. You know, Tulsa had a port, didn't you? <laughs> but that caused them to put in all kinds of locks and dams to back up the water. And, and, and there's places on the Arkansas River up there that we used to fish up there and catch a little, little like a huge lake and it backed it up so much. You'd see the big barges come up, they come all the way up New Orleans, I don't know. All the way up. Um, now, here's my point that ties into this. Because they introduced so much more bodies of water up there, you would have in the summertime when it gets so hot and it gets as hot as it does here in the summertime, there'd be a lot more thunderstorms running, mm -hmm. a lot more rain popping up. That didn't mean they didn't have droughts. It just meant that they, they didn't have that <laughs> readiness of rain. Why? Well, as anybody knows now, there <laughs> up comes the moisture and form. There's a lot more moisture down there. Guess what? It's going to form, and these thunder showers will come up. This came along, which they didn't, didn't have at, that, uh, at other times before water wasn't there. Well, now you think about it. how much of the earth is covered by water? Uh, I think 70%. Two thirds, maybe mm -hmm. like something like that. When I think about that for a minute, how in the world could you have that much water and not have evaporation? Think about, think about that. Think about how much, how much fresh water is being brought out of the ocean from just sun evaporation. Mm -hmm. Well, here God in making a point through the wise man, the preacher, is saying if you just view life as a human being without God and just as it's all here, anti of anti, all is anti. It just keeps going on. All this stuff just keeps happening. Uh, all things that I've already read are full of labor. Man kind of under it. The eyes not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. Can you can you put that in just common words? I 
a pretty common word out there, but that's the result. Well, um, how does that change? It does, doesn't it? I would say from verse 3 all the way at this point through verse 11, he's trying to say, whoever you are, nothing changes. Now you say, yeah, but at 70 some odd years old, I certainly have changed from what it was when I was 20. But the way things work haven't changed. Were there people 60, 70, 80, 90 years old when you were 20? No. Did you ever try when you were a young person to try to comprehend what it was like being an old person? Then you turned around that twice and you were that old person. Now, can you remember as an older person what it was like to be a young person? <laughs> You can recall it to mind, but you know, I say, I did I ever have the energy to do that? <laughs> but, <laughs> but, you know, things like that. But has that always been the case? And you're going to see it even more later in, in, in the book. But this seems to be a ploy of the devil to get people anchored to the flesh. And thus they don't see beyond it. It, it's like you have a blindfold on, and all you can see is inside that blindfold. So, notice the thing that hath been is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done, and there's no new thing under the sun. Don't lose sight of the fact there's no new thing where? Yes. Under the sun. Uh, so, he's talking about his things done in the flesh in material things and time and space here on this earth. And again, somebody might say, well, they never had automobiles like we had. They never saw a locomotive or an airplane. So things have changed. The people who operate those things, have they changed? Because I can go down the road a lot faster, or I can go somewhere and be there in a matter of hours where it used to take days. How has that changed my outlook on life as to what's important, what's not? What are the things that, that we, was being pointed out to us when I was in graduate work in the early 80s? Is that we're going to enter the information age. What do you think they meant? Because now that's 40 years ago. In the information age, did we have information before that? What were those in the know recognizing about what was taking place in technology in America and the world? No, the computer itself. Well, uh, you didn't hear about something <laughs> happening until, you know, three or four weeks or months or something like that. Give a good example of that. Good example yeah. of it. You may have heard it when the, the uh, war between states ended. That was what April. No, I think it was April. So anyway, uh, anyway, throughout the month of April, Confederate yeah. armies were were, were, uh, were surrendering. Uh, the last battle ever fought was fought here in Texas down on the coast. But um, nevertheless, the slaves in Texas didn't hear about. Their freedom, or well, even the end of the war, till in the summer, after the war was over, they, and that's you know news. He's traveled so slow. Now to them, they're living in it, so it didn't seem slow because all news travel that way. Um, so I find it interesting. So what's the what's the difference? Well, regardless of how fast news travels and how quickly we can get to so many things. You've heard me say sometimes we do research for something or other, how fast I can find things, uh, Googling it and all that kind of thing. And, and, and the libraries that are available, you've got all your big libraries in the world virtually available. You may have to pay a fee to get on them, but you can get in there and you can research about anything that is research. That the best of scholars research. So well, how does that change anything from what he's saying here? What happens is people are, people will say, well, the computer, has given us more time. What do we do with that time? We pile it on more and more. The more these gadgets give us, quote, 
free time, unquote, from work, what do we do? Stay on them. Well, we don't just stay on them, but we either, yeah. we, we may do it a lot. Of course, a whole lot of folks do. But I'm saying we just simply incorporate that time and adding more onto it. We just keep doing the same thing. Well, what's he saying here? He's saying that. Uh, that thing that hath been it, that is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done. There's no new thing under the sun. I don't care whether it's uh, working as fast as the newest computer today works or no computer 75 years ago. Uh, it's still, you're filled up. I read an editorial in uh, Alexander Campbell. In fact, after he died, his son in law was, <clears throat> was editing the Millennial Harbinger. And he was writing toward the end of the year of 1865. And he was saying, where did this year go? It just seems like more and more things are happening that for and buying for our time. Well, think about 1865. How did you come to learn about anything? Whether you went to school, or you read the book, or people wrote you letters and you wrote back to them, or you read the newspapers or magazines. How else did you get it? You did he couldn't even conceive of a telephone, which wasn't a few years uh, ahead of him that or later. So the thing that gets us is not all this technology, because we're still the same human beings. And if you were going to put things, things, material things, first and to dominate your life, whether it was 1865 or whenever it might be, or now. Well, who knows what will be going on a uh, hundred years from now? I mean, we couldn't even see the things that we have going on today, even 20 years ago. But people are still people. Things are still going on. What's happened in the world regarding wars? They change. Think about World War II, such a terrible war. Well, you've got a generation of people now asking about it. They may not even know what's going on. And certainly don't know what has happened. Um, but look at look at the people of the world. Have they changed any? What's happened between Russia and the Ukraine? What's China trying to do? All these things. You think it's going to change? Yeah. Why? Because people remain the same. The aspirations, the desires of worldly people Motivated by the lust of flesh, that's not as part of life. So if there's no God, and we're here, it doesn't change. Now, watch verse 11. There is no remembrance of former things. Neither shall there be any remembrance of things that are to come with those that shall come after. What's he trying to say? I, I started to do this. I've done it before, but it's a long time. And I don't, I, I, can't, I can't do it with this very easy. Get a, a cup of water. Stick your finger down here. Pull it out. How long does the hole stay there? That's how long you're going to be remembered. How many of you knew your great grandparents? Yeah. No, very well. How many of you remember much about them? When did you know your great grandparents? How old were they when you know you? In their late seventies, early eighties. Okay. So you never saw them no. as forties, fifties, no. and so you never saw them. <laughs> well, I knew of one set of my great grandparents. He didn't. He was a bad like freshman in college. Yet I never knew him as a young person. Now, since all of their deaths, uh, I found pictures of them when they were young that other folks never did. See, that's where you get that funny feeling that I've called them what I want to found. And there's nobody to tell with any interest. And that's the point. People are gone. Uh, people that amounted to a whole lot. People that had a great impact, but they're gone. And we only remember those that made such an impact they get recorded in history books or there's some sort of statue or whatever. How many of you your great great grandparents? Well, in history, how long a time ago was that? 
as far as history is concerned. Not very long. How long, how long ago was it the uh, Civil War took place? And the whole country's torn to pieces. How long was it? About 100, it ended about 158. 158 years ago, I believe, 1865. Now, that's not long, but uh, how much of an impact did that have on people? I mean, people care. And this is the point. Don't lose sight of that. Um, how many people died today? You know, it meant something to somebody, but nothing to me. <laughs> Just don't think. But see, this is the thing I always remind myself of. But God knows, and God cared about every single solitary one of them, and Christ died for every one of them. I think, how many, how many brethren do we know? Well, not really very many compared to those throughout the world. How many brethren do you personally know in Africa? How many brethren do you personally know in the Ukraine? Is it bothering you that brethren in Ukraine may have had their houses blown away and starved to death? I mean, we may generally pray about it, but I don't think it's personal. And that is, I don't want to call a face. So, all I'm saying by using all that is that even in things that concern us, that are important in the sense of spiritual matters, they're still a good distance. Think, uh, you know, we have hospitals all around us. Think of many, how many people are in those hospitals right now. Suffering to the nth degree. He's going to keep you awake tonight. No. It's just the way that it works. And that's the point being made here. That's the way the world is. Now, please don't please don't get the idea that this is the way a Christian ought to be. We're not saying that. Christian has a different viewpoint. Walks in a different light. Sees things in a different way. Handles life completely differently. Makes up his or her mind in a completely different way. So you have, if you're programmed with the truth and living for the truth and using this life to get ready for eternity, you're going to see everything different. Probably is I've found a whole lot of members of the church you don't see a whole lot of difference from those outside the church. And that's what bothers me. Evidently, these people at this day and time didn't because this this was written primarily to the Jews who God has chosen people at that time. Bless you. Verse 12. I, the preacher, was king over Israel and Jerusalem. Now, this is going back to this idea of who he was and what he had because of who he was. So he says, I gave my heart. The heart in the Old Testament doesn't just cover the emotion. Many times today, we make a difference in heart and mind. We shouldn't if we speak as the orphans of God. The heart as it's used here <laughs> means the intellect. It means the rational powers we have. It means our will. It means our emotions. It means our conscience. Now, what is he saying? And I gave my heart to seek and search out my wisdom concerning all things that are done under heaven. This sword prevail hath God given to the sons of man to be exercised therewith. If you or, and let me just back up, I'll try to say it this way, the most dedicated Christian, you still have to live in this world. You still have obligations that are upon you. Just say, for example, what the Bible teaches about the obligation of a husband. Um, the obligation of a wife, parents. Those are things peculiar to this world. The Lord regulates them, teaches how to live in those given ones. So you still have those things that you participate in and you do that are really necessary in this life. But they only go in this life. They will not go beyond this life. Now the person who's caught up strictly in seeing this world as if that's all there is to it. That person is never going to even hardly acknowledge uh, God the Bible. If he does, this fellow this afternoon told me several things, but one of the things he said as he finished our discussion, 
He said, I pray every night for you to sleep. But see, he's worked it out in his mind. Because he knows nothing about the scheme of redemption. He knows nothing about the church, significance of the church, why the Lord built the church. He knows nothing about all spiritual blessings that the faces are located in Christ. Nothing about that. He's got it worked out. And that's satisfying. That and then I found out something. I, ha I have to infer here something he may not have intended to imply, but I think he did. I was trying to explain to him about the church or just what little bit I could that was in the denomination. And he answered me this way. He said, you know, he explained how they used to keep his wife and every young. Uh, they went to St. Louis and they went to this church and that church and another one. I went around here from Virginia and Maryland and moved to Dallas and ended up down here. And they lived in Dallas. And he said, I was even a um, Sunday school teacher in the and he said, uh, we had a baby. He was born and he died the same day. And I locked him up with him. I can only notice I say infer, he may not have meant to imply that they were upset because God was the baby died. Now I can't testify that court, but I don't know why he would have brought it up there then, because uh, he was telling me why they did not go to any church anymore. It was after that that he said, I I pray for that. Now, think about this and think about how people let the affairs of this world that are bad. But they blame it on God even they believe in God. What? How much real biblical faith did they have in God in the first place they would do that? Uh, David said his baby died and he said, I can't bring him back, but I know him. Why can't we have that answer? Yet? But he doesn't. These folks don't know the Bible. They don't know what to say about it. These are the people we're dealing with that they even believe in God. Extend he does. Uh, he says that he gave his heart. That means he gave all that he had of himself, of his inner man. To find out all these things. I've seen all the works that are done in the Son, verse 14. And behold, all is vanity, the next action of spirit. Well, again, now he's right back on the same thing. In other words, what can I do? Here's one fellow earns a PhD and is, writes books and discovers things and whatever. Okay. Here's another one that is glad to get the job as a uh, garbage collector and work for a city that pays him good wage and has good benefits. Here's another one who becomes a teacher. Here's another insurance salesman. Anything you want to think of, car mechanic, uh, uh, owns a lawn mowing service, <laughs> becomes a nurse, whatever. If they see the all in all in that job itself, regardless of how high men value it, and truly, how difficult it may be to get there due to the well intellectual capability some things require. Um, it's still an exhalation of spirit. All there is is this. Think of how many people are vexed, and then ask yourself the question. I guess you have to ask first of all, what does it mean to be vexed? I didn't say hexed. <laughs> I said vexed. What does it mean when if something vexes you? What does it do? We say bother. Yeah. I doubt we use the word vex that much. Vex would be a very strong bother. That you say to me, you wear the horn, but we're good to go. Uh, or when he got really upset, but he still wasn't as upset that he could be. He would say he was making an animal mad. So, <laughs> I, don't wish, I wish I knew where he got all those things. But, uh, but the point is, things bother us, and they can bother us real terribly. Mm -hmm. Now, the question is, what vexes me? Now, we see Lot, and Peter tells us, by inspiration, what was the impact of that highly amoral, immoral city upon Lot? It vexed his right, it vexed righteous Lot from day to day. He saw all that stuff and around it, and he was. Eaten alive, we would say. Um, 
I don't see how a person can be godly, know what life's all about, be living faithful and loving God and growing his knowledge, and not be vexed by this present world. Uh, you, ever, you ever have the idea, I just want to get away? <laughs> well, you can't run from the world in the sense of ignoring it. You can't go up on top of some mountain. You might do that for a while. You ever notice Jesus himself went away for a while? He went by himself, went off on the mountain to pray. He received refreshing, but he came back. God put the church, the individual Christians that make up that church, in this world. Now, we've got to have a different view from this. That which is crooked cannot be made straight, and that which is wanting cannot be numbered. That's, don't lose sight of all this stuff we've said here, because all he's saying is, it works the same way as everything. You know, it's always going to be like You think if we live another 20 years, you think you'll see the end of hurricanes and tornadoes? Uh, will there be plane crashes? Yeah. Will there be car crashes? Will there be people murdering one another and robbing one another? All of those, yeah, just that way. And yet, this is the cause of the great amount of mental illness among a lot of people because they're trying to escape reality. Well, there is no way. The Bible teaches you how to live in reality. The Bible says you try to convert people. I commune with my own heart, verse 16, saying, Lo, I have come to the greatest state, and I've got more wisdom than all they that have been before me in Jerusalem. Yea, my heart had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. And I gave my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I perceive that this also is vexation of spirit. For in much wisdom is much grief, and he that increases knowledge increases sorrow. Well, again, that's true if all there is this life. I really have tried to figure out a fellow that is a genuine atheist. God does not exist. There's nothing spiritual in this. What purpose of life do you have? Um, so famous atheists or infamous atheists in England. Hawkins. Dawkins. Dawkins. The other one was Hawkins. He died. But <laughs> my name is more. Uh, Dawkins. Dawkins said the only reason for man to exist is to propagate his DNA. Well, I asked myself the question what made you come to that conclusion? What is there about you that made you think that's the purpose? I mean, why should he even think that? Uh, in fact, your thought processes are nothing more than atoms running into one another. <laughs> and why should I believe anything like that? It's all uh, this molecule ran into that one that was actually to begin with. So why should I believe in that? <laughs> that, that see, it, it's good that atheists do not live consistently and logically with their own beliefs. There's no matter what they would do. Any comments or questions? We're up on 15 till or a little past. I need to pour one too, but we'll go. We will. We'll be ready to go. Any questions or any of this stuff I've studied? I'm I'm hitting the high ground because we're not gonna study the individual words in Hebrew or anything like that. I'm just talking about what is the main message he wants us to get. What do you think it is? What perspective is he coming from? The world, the, the earth, right? yeah, there's, there's no God, there's yes. no anything but what's here, right? And God is missing from, yeah. and, and this, therefore, what? Well, you can see then, as he says, by he puts his heart into it, as he ended up thing here in chapter one, uh, everything you do then is just irritating, everything you do aggravates. That's basically what life is, is aggravation. Vexation. So, you have any kind of any questions that you might want to ask about?